Before we get to the episode today, I want to thank our sponsor, Surf Prep Sanding. Whether you're looking for the highest quality of sanders, dust extractors, or abrasives, Surf Prep has what you need to take your project to the next level. I've been using Surf Prep for a couple of years now and know firsthand the quality of their products. The amazing family who stands behind their brand is by far the best in the industry. Use code MAKERLOUNGE, all one word, for 10% off your order at surfprepsanding.com. So huge thanks to Surf Prep for sponsoring today's episode. Um, I think you may have just joined the Surf Prep family. We'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, but uh, also want to thank uh, our patrons. We've got a number of top tier patrons. We call them rock stars around here. Uh, we've got Jimmy McAnally. He's from Houston. Uh, we've got Matthew with Archiano Sirio, Victor with Wim Design, Justin with Calvary Customs, and Brent with Clean Cut Woodworking, along with several others. And uh, if you want to get in on the patron uh, action, we stream the episodes live on YouTube. And uh, so we've got a Discord as well. And we talk about ideas for future episodes and various other things, live events coming up. Um, we've got a group that we're, we're actually, so speaking with Surf Prep, we're going to be recording an episode with Hannah and Skylar at WorkbenchCon. Um, and all of the patron members will get a special invite to that uh, recording. So lots of great stuff happening over on Patreon. So if you want to get in on that action, patreon.com slash Maker Lounge Podcast. Welcome to the lounge. I'm Matt with Voltner Woodworking and your host of the Maker Lounge Podcast, where we have a rotating group of makers hanging out and talking shop with each other. Whether you're looking for hard wood or for someone to stick your wood in a kiln for proper treatment, today's guest in the lounge has you covered. His mustache measures approximately one third of a board foot and is as impressive as his business portfolio. <laughs> Save the trees. <laughs> Save the trees appears to be this guy's motto. <laughs> the, the only thing cooler than the slabs he makes is his name. Matt with M2 Lumber is with me in the lounge. Matt, I love the name. That, that, was, a, that was an amazing intro. Fantastic. <laughs> Especially Thanks. I try hard. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, so we have a patron that uh, asked a question about about the mustache. So, oh, we'll yeah. have to get to that. Yeah. But save the trees. Oh is that the uh, save the trees? Is that the the motto? That that is the official company uh, slogan motto, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. That's that's what I have decided that we will do to to brand us. Um, we thought about we wanted to pick something specifically. And for a long time, I always struggled with what we would use because we do so much. We, yeah. we build furniture, we, but we also mill lumber, we kiln dry, we do CNC services. So, so we do so much. It's hard to say, I can't just say I'm a furniture company. I can't just say right. I'm a sawmill. Um, and so save the trees is just kind of a very purposefully vague almost ironic thing that makes people ask. And then that's where we get to explain like, well, this is why we say we save the trees because we take urban trees that normally would go to waste. We mill them up. Uh, we kill and dry them. We sell them to the public, or we could also build furniture ourselves. So whatever. But in the end, we are keeping them out of a landfill. So we're saving them so they can be used in long, much longer, much longer lived afterlives. Yeah. So so save the trees is is not uh, pallet furniture. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not pallet furniture at all. A lot of people think it's irony because they. A lot of people know it's mainly for for being a sawmill, and they're like, "Oh, you're being sarcastic." And I'm like, "No, not really." Because yeah, I mean, if if we don't take these trees and mill them up, sure, someone else might. But just in general, if if us small sawmills don't take these trees and mill them, they go to the landfill. That's wow. that's what they do. So, yeah. um, and we've, we've made some, we, and, and our customers have made some beautiful pieces of furniture and, you know, well-built furniture the last a hundred years. So, right. I mean, we're, we're doing a, a good thing with that. Yeah. You're based in, uh, South Carolina. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Our we're, headquarters what, is what here in, in Lawrence, South Carolina. We're about, uh, most people are familiar with Greenville, which is one of the bigger cities okay. in the upstate, but we're about 15 to 20 minutes South of Greenville. Uh, Columbia, which is our state capital, we're about an hour northwest of Columbia. Okay, so you're near uh, Izzy and John. 
I uh, am. Yeah. yeah. Izzy is in Greenville. Um, okay. That's where he's uh, headquartered at right now. He's about mm, 35 minute drive for me, 40 minutes maybe, because he's kind of on the other side of downtown. Yeah. And I don't know where John, John lives on Lincoln street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's no secret. Um, right. But uh, I think he's about the same, probably 30, 40 minutes away. Okay. Yeah. It, so uh, if I come up that way, I can, we can have a maker meetup. <laughs> Absolutely. There's so many Do, people that we get that, that, cause we're right beside the interstate 85. Okay. Um, I don't know if you know, Nick stated Woodsco, uh, yeah. he, you know, he stopped by, I mean, we've had so many other people, uh, gosh, I mean, people come up all the time from, you know, major cities around this area and even far away. I mean, we've had people from New York, Virginia, Charleston, um, Savannah, Florida, you name it. They, they're just yeah. coming through the area and they can stop by. It's not a problem. Nice. Are you surrounded by woods and, and that type of thing? Or is, how do you source your kind, material? Kind of, sort of. Um, we don't, there's no trees on my property. We have, we're not, we're fortunate enough. We have four acres of land here, but it's, hmm. we don't cut any trees down um, on our property or anything like that. But um, no, we're just, we're very fortunate to be in the area that we're in and that there is lots of development going on in this area. So they're clearing land, they're clearing acreage. Um, and then you just have your normal, you know, we we're semi fortunate that it's tornado area. Uh, oh, so yeah. <laughs> every tornado season, we, we get yeah. a nice little slew of trees that come down and they have yeah. to be hauled off and stuff. And then just your normal, you know, tree removal for whatever reason, it's damaging a foundation, it's overhanging a house or blah, blah, blah. Um, there is no shortage of trees. In most areas, to be honest, what's what's unique about where we are, which is really nice, is the variety that we get. If you go about an hour south of us to Columbia, you have basically three options, pine, uh, some oak, and cedar or cypress. Oh, wow. That's it. Those are your, those are your, you don't see much of anything else. Um, we are within our 30, 45 minute radius of where we are. We easily get our hands on walnut, maple, cherry, red cedar, red oak, white oak, poplar, um, pine, of course, but we don't cut pine. Um, right. We get uh, some more rare species like locust or ash or uh, mulberry or fruit trees or pecan or hickory. So we, we have quite a lot of options um, that we're able to have on hand, which is really nice. So you say pecan. <laughs> pecan, pecan, pecan. Dude, I've had people from Georgia, Charleston, Virginia. I've heard every single way you can say it. There's like six different ways to say it. I say yeah. pecan. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I say it differently every time I say it. <laughs> so now I just say hickory. I do too. When someone comes in and they say pecan, I say pecan. I don't want to start right. any kind of feuds or whatever. I'll just go with whatever they say. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you've, you've got four acres and that, and that's your property and, and your business yeah. is on your property. It is. Yeah, yeah, it is. That's the commute's terrible. It's yeah. I bet. It's a hundred <laughs> yards of wet grass. It's just awful. My shoes yeah. get soaked. It's terrible. Yeah. So when, did, when did you start all this? So the, Give me the back history, the, the biggest part of the business, I would say, is what kicked off uh, is the sawmill and the lumberyard part of it. That's That only started six years ago. But to go back a little bit further, I'm not going to make it a really long story, but oh, we got um, my, my, <laughs> my dad, who is a very, very talented woodworker by, by hobby, not by profession. He's a medical professional, but by hobby was a very, very talented woodworker. Um, I mean, I've got memories at least as young as eight years old or younger, probably of being in the wood shop and whether I'm <laughs> receiving 16 foot long strips of cedar, he's ripping on a table <laughs> saw or helping him do something to, I almost cut my finger off on a bandsaw once. I mean, oh, so wow. I, I've been, I've been in a wood shop, uh, more or less for 20 years, okay. um, without aging myself too much. So, so I've been doing woodworking type stuff for a very, very long time. I got more serious, of course, uh, later in life. So when I got out of college, that's when I got, I turned back to it as a, as a healthy hobby. 
None of my right. college hobbies were healthy, of course. Um, oh, so yeah. a, a <laughs> productive and healthy hobby is, is what I was looking for after school when I had a career and I had a full-time job, what had something to do on the side. And so I went back to the woodworking, started, you know, normal things, building cutting boards, furniture for our house. I got married. We had kids, all that other stuff. Yeah. Um, but when we moved out, out here, and I say out here because most people around here would say we live out in the country because we kind of do. We have four acres of land. Most of our neighbors around us, everyone has several acres as well. Um, mm -hmm. That was in 2015. And shortly after that is when the gear started turning. And I started thinking, you know, that was when Matt Cremona was just, you know, really kicking ass on YouTube with everything that he was doing. And everybody, I'm pretty sure, was watching him at that time. Is you know, like the urban logging and the sawmill and everything he was doing. And I was like, man, I want to. I want to do that too. And <laughs> I mean, I, it, so I started on a, on a whim when a tree came down, uh, on the line of my property, and my neighbors, my neighbor is awesome. Is he's 92 years old now. Um, oh, wow. his name is Mr. Yeah. His name is Mr. Bob. He's in lots of our videos on Instagram. He still gets around at 92. When yeah, I first started, great. when we first started milling wood, he was, this was a couple years ago. So he was maybe 89 only. I mean, he was there. He was helping me offload boards from a sawmill, and and we used his tractor to move it around. So uh, he's an awesome guy. But when the tree, what tree came down on our property, and I was just going to chop it up for firewood, he's the one who said, "Hey, why don't we, we'll take this over to a sawmill and mill it up." And my eyes just lit up. I was like, "What are you talking about? What sawmill?" <laughs> <laughs> and there's so there's another sawmill that is a a very large industrial sawmill um, down the road from us, and he knew the guy who ran the place and owned it. So sure enough, we showed up with this log on a trailer and I said, Hey, how much to saw this up? And I mean, it's nothing. He charged me like $80 to saw up yeah. an entire trailer load full of wood. Wow. So that was it. I was, I was hooked at that point. And then, then I started scrounging the internet, trying to find logs and trees that were down all this other stuff. And we did that for about six months, maybe even a year of just taking logs over to him and having him mill it up and bringing it back. And, you know, I'm YouTube and Matt Cremona and trying to figure out, you know, how do you stack it? How do you sticker it? I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. How do you stack yeah. wood? How do you sticker it? How do you make sure that it dries evenly? What's the best way to sticker it? You know, and all this, all this good stuff. And did that for about a year and started selling it online. I got very lucky looking back. I was very fortunate. Facebook started marketplace Oh, right wow. around this time, 2016. Nice. Yeah, I think I was probably one of the first people to start selling wood on market in our area. Of course, I was yeah. one of the first. If you were to go on marketplace and look for wood, it was it was we were the only ones that showed up. Wow, because it's just it was such a new thing. And, and were you doing it by that, yourself at this point? It, me and Bob, the 89 yeah. year old. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Me and me and me and Bob next door, and and. You know, he was just helping me. He doesn't really know anything, a whole lot about the woodworking side of it or anything like that, but he was, he was right along there with me. And, um, so yeah, we were just selling it to the public. You know, it was, it was wet wood. It was rough sawn. It wasn't the greatest, but people were buying it. Yeah. So at that point, that is when I, at that time, at least took the biggest leap in my mind. And I went out and I bought a sawmill of my own so that we could do it ourselves. So I scrounged up fourteen thousand dollars. Wow! <laughs> which, wow. in the grand scheme of things, <laughs> yeah. is not a, no. That's not a lot at all yeah. compared to what else we spend. But at that yeah. point in time, I was just like, "Oh my God, fourteen thousand dollars! Do I really want to do this?" Yeah, yeah. You got to be committed to, to do fourteen thousand dollars, kind of a, like on a on yeah a hope at this point, well, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I, I mean, we had made some sales. It was working out. And so in my mind, I justified it. I said, you know what? Even if I don't make money off of this, I can at least cut enough wood, build enough furniture to pay off $14,000. Yeah. You know what? Even if it takes me five years or whatever, like I can do that. I know I, because I was already building tables for people, you know, and selling them for $1,000 or whatever, which is really cheap right. at that time. Yeah. So, um, so we did it. And, um, that was the best gamble I ever made. We, we, we were, we were able to cut so much faster and so much better quality because we were doing it ourselves. And I mean, I think in one summer we milled up probably, and this was many years ago, all we had is a sawmill. We didn't have any other equipment. 
we probably did t- ten to fifteen thousand board feet in one summer. Wow, worth of worth of wood. Which, to put it in perspective, now we cut about forty to fifty thousand a year. But Dang. back then, when we didn't yeah. have much equipment, that was a big deal. So, um, and it was we got really lucky off the bat. We were we were getting walnut logs, cherry logs, like really nice stuff that mm-hmm. we were able to sell. And then, um, and then, yeah, one thing just led to the n- another. After that, we built. I learned that there wasn't as much value in green wood as there is dry wood. So I built a solar kiln. Um, we built a solar kiln in 2018, I think. We had that for about two years. And then we just weren't able to keep up, even with the solar kiln, because the demand was so high and people were coming out. That's when COVID hit. Demand went through the roof even more when COVID mm. hit. Um, and then um, we... We took that opportunity from that increase in business. And just two years ago, we built our shop now that we have. It's 3,200 square foot shop. And yeah. we have our I dry vacuum kiln that we put right outside beside it. So now we can dry wood much faster than we could with the solar kiln. And uh, we also bought a loader. The loader was a really big game changer because we can pick up. I can basically pick up an entire stack of wood, which in the beginning, we would have to load the kiln by hand one board at a time. Oh, to, wow. to do a yeah. to do a to do a kiln exchange, like unload it and reload it, that was easily six hours. That was mm. that's what we were gonna do for the day. Now it's like ten minutes. Wow, that's <laughs> so impressive. Yeah, it was a big it was a big game changer having the Kubota loader. So for the people who don't understand the difference between a solar kiln and uh, what did you say? It's an eye kiln. Uh, we have a so we have a vacuum kiln. It's made by a company called iDry. They're located in Vermont, a uh, U.S. based company. Yep, uh, it's actually a surprisingly I call it a small company. Still, they do really good, uh, make a great product and lots of business. But it's it's not huge. They were at IWF, and I mean the owner was there with his sales team and his like four people. <laughs> mm, wow, it's, it's they have yeah. a lot of employees I know to build it, but as far as admin staff, you know, it's not like there's thousands of them. It's it's a pretty right. small company in Vermont, and it's a great company. They have great tech support. I haven't had many issues, but every time I've called them for help, um, you know, they've always been there. So it, it's a great machine. But yeah, it's a vacuum kiln. So um, the difference between a vacuum kiln and a solar kiln, other than cost, it's <laughs> yeah. a big difference. <laughs> yeah. Is um, the vacuum kiln, the, the major benefit to it is that it pulls all the air out, hence the name vacuum kiln. And so without getting too scientific-y, you know, our normal atmospheric pressure is 14.7 PSI. It pulls it down to about 3 PSI. Mm-hmm. What happens when you reduce the pressure of, of an atmosphere is that well, a lot of things happen, but one important thing that happens is it lowers the boiling point of water. Okay. Water normally boils at 212 degrees at atmospheric pressure. At 3 psi, it boils at 150. Mm. Okay. So you you are, they probably will tell me I'm saying this wrong, but you're you're essentially boiling the water out of the wood. Let um, me check with my. It fact sounds checkers. violent. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds violent, but but that's essentially what you're able to do. You don't have to go to an extremely high temperature. In a normal atmosphere, you would have to go to a very, very high temperature to try to get the moisture out quickly, and that damages the wood. With a vacuum, you can go at a lower temperature and still get the same effect. Gotcha. So from a time perspective, if you have a uh, eight-quarter log or you know piece that you're trying to uh, yeah. vacuum or you use this, this new kiln versus what you were doing mm-hmm. before, what, from a time perspective, what's the difference? Um, months versus weeks. Wow. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's a big game changer. The so, capacity when we had just the solar kiln was about 10,000 board feet a year, 12,000. Okay. Basically we had a, we, we built a kiln that could hold roughly 2000 board feet of lumber, the, the solar kiln. And if we were lucky in the summertime, we could get six loads in there. If we're oh, lucky, wow. a lot yeah. of times we didn't cause it's totally dependent on the weather. Sun has to yeah. be shining. It needs to be hot. It doesn't really work yeah. that great if it's not. Um, so with the vacuum kiln, it's not an issue at all. It runs off electricity, runs 24-7. So, yeah, and, and the solar kiln, you were shut down during the winter times most of the time for, for that type of work? or Yeah, I mean, yes and no. For me, now that I, you know, 
there's two reasons that you kiln dry wood. One is to remove the moisture so that it doesn't move on you too much after you build something with it. But two is to kill the bugs that are in it. Mm. And, and I say to kill the bugs that are in it uh, because after <laughs> six years of milling wood, I can promise you it's not if there's bugs in it. They yeah. are in there. The question yeah. is, what type are they? And are they going to get really bad and make a huge infestation? Um, right. They are in there. And so you can, for example, leave wood in a solar kiln in the wintertime. I've got some in there right now. Um, but it's not getting a temperature high enough to kill bugs. It'll get mm. up to, you know, in our climate, it'll be probably 50 degrees or something like that tomorrow. The kiln will probably hit up to 80 if it's sunny out. But mm -hmm. you have to hit 130 degrees minimum and hold there for several hours to kill bugs. Wow. And so it's not – you can do that in the summertime. The summertime, it gets up to 160 degrees. That's, that's not hard for it to do down here because we're in the southeast. Um, yeah. But in the wintertime, it doesn't work out too well. Nothing worse than pouring in a nice epoxy table and then having a bug press its face up just as it's starting to cure. <laughs> yep. And, and I have seen it since we – I have dried finished tables in our vacuum kiln. Yeah. If that tells you something. People have oh, brought yeah. us furniture that's already been finished because there's holes coming out of it where bugs are chewing their way out. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, there's bugs in there. Right. So what is a, what is a unit like that uh, run? They are not cheap, especially compared to the solar kiln. Um, I think their latest price on the one that I have is $60,000. Mm. Okay. Um. And then you have to consider, you know, transportation costs, which is going to vary depending on where you are, and mm -hmm. installation cost. I chose to put it on a concrete slab and to build a semi-closed building around it um, and all that stuff. So it cost me around $75,000 to get yeah. it installed and running. Yeah. Um, so in, in the chat here on YouTube, we've got uh, some of the Patreon uh, members and one of the okay. members, Justin with Calvary Customs, is asking how many mills and kilns do you have? So you have the two vacuum. I've got you one sawmill, one sawmill, okay. and the two two kilns. I've got the solar kiln and the vacuum kiln, and we still use the solar kiln. Um, mm -hmm. But because now that I had the vacuum kiln, what we generally end up doing is the solar kiln. One, it only runs in the summertime, but we put basically low density woods that don't take that long to dry and thin material. So for example, all your four quarter, you know, maple and cedar and poplar, that kind of stuff. That's what we put in the solar kiln. We'll leave gotcha. it in there for a couple of weeks and it'll be dry and we can take it out. The thicker gotcha. stuff, which is harder to dry, that goes in the vacuum kiln. Gotcha. Uh, so what type of woods are you seeing there? Like, I mean, you, you mentioned you get a, a wide variety. It, what's the weirdest... Mm -hmm. uh, or most uh, unique type of wood that you have seen come through there? Most unique. It's probably going to be a tie. Um, we got a fairly large, at least for this species, China berry once. And most people haven't China seen berry. that before. Okay. Hmm. China berry tree. Yep. It's actually in the mahogany family. Oh, so wow. it's, it's a very hard and a very pretty wood. It kind of has a a grain similar to that of ash as far as the structure of it, but the color is mahogany uh, type color. It's, it's a really cool looking species. And um, so we got one of those. And when I say it was big, it was like 14 inches in diameter, 16 okay. maybe. And, and we got a couple of logs out of it that were five to six feet long. They don't get huge. Yeah. But it was big enough to where we could actually mill it up. So that was pretty cool. So what's the capacity of your sawmill that you can, like, what's the biggest the sawmill? Block? It's, it's a, it's a Woodmiser LT 15 wide. So, uh, you know, they advertise 36 inches width. You really can't do that. Actually, it's about 34 is about the biggest I've ever cut on it. And, um, I have enough track set up right now to cut 15 feet. Okay. You can add as many track sections as you want, but I don't. Because we got the vacuum kiln now, the it's a max length of twelve feet. Okay. So I don't cut. It. I don't. I don't usually cut anything over twelve foot long. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess the that's a very niche type of thing. Uh, you know, something that's going to be longer than that. 
Yeah, that's I not mean, somebody building people furniture. Call, yeah, people people call every once in a while, and they want you know sixteen foot, eighteen foot slabs. And I know there's other sawmills out there that have made a business out of just doing that. But mm. if I can't kiln dry it, there's really no point in me cutting it because it doesn't have much value to it. Right. Now, is it true you can you could leave it out for a couple of years in yeah in you know yeah. under cover yeah. or something? Yes, you but, can air dry it, but again, the the bugs is just yeah. You know, you, you, there's nothing that you can. Some old schools argue with me about it, and we, I did that YouTube video with, with John, and you can just go read through the comments on there because we talked about this in that YouTube video. Yeah, and man, some of them got just absolutely irate. I mean, yeah. just ripped it to shreds. Like that's not true. Air dried wood is fine. I'm like, I didn't say it's not fine. It's just yeah. that there are bugs in it, and you just, you never know what kind of bug it is. It could be the kind that just crawls out and dies. It could be the kind that lays a million eggs and then now your whole entire house is infested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen people so. throw, throw their wood in like a stove. Like if, if, if you're doing cutting boards or something like that, sometimes they'll take the yeah. the wood and put it in the stove. And I, I guess that, uh, I guess it bakes them just in place in, in the wood. Yeah. It's same concept. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or, that's, yeah. that's, yeah, exactly. I, that's a joke when sometimes people come in and they say, so there's no bugs in your wood? I said, oh, no, they're in there. Yeah. They're yeah. just dead. <laughs> they're cooked. Yeah. So you may find one in there. And I've done it before. I've been planing a board and I'll open up a little hole. And sure enough, there's like a larvae in there. But oh. it's like mummified. I mean, it's hard as a rock. Like, yeah. it, it doesn't make them magically disappear. It just kills them. Right. Just throw a little star bond on it. It'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs> Clear so you can see them in there. Yeah. Uh, so you, d you do slabs, you do, uh, you do the kiln, you do mm -hmm. furniture. You, so mm -hmm. you, you've, you've got a, a lot of things going on. Uh, how do you manage all of this uh, type of stuff that you're doing? It's not just you uh, now, on, right? It's not you and Bob anymore. Depending on who you ask, I don't, I don't do it too well, maybe. <laughs> but no, yeah, it's not just me. I have, I have a good bit of help now, thankfully. So I have... Uh, there's myself, there's another uh, person that I hired who um, was a customer of mine, and uh, we got together about a year ago and came up with a mutually beneficial agreement to where he works for me now, because uh, he was doing woodworking and stuff on his own. Mm -hmm. So he works for me now, but he's in a, another location. He's in Seneca, which is about an hour away. Uh, his name is Trent Loftus, and uh, so he sells wood out of his location over there. We're trying to start up another you know sales point that can be you know geographically more convenient for certain people yeah um and then he also builds furniture on his own too which is you know 100 percent commission based for himself um so that works out really well uh for him there's no you know i'm not tied down to having to pay him a salary or anything and he right. can basically just work when he wants to nice um so then other than him uh we have uh two other part-time employees um, a teenager, and then uh, <laughs> another gentleman uh, who is uh, seventy-two years old. Okay. His name is Larry. He Bob's son. He well, <laughs> it, it, no, it's not. It's not Bob's son. I mean, the the thing is, is is that I've had a lot of people approach me and ask if they can come work for me, or yeah. you know. And the problem is, is that I'm we're doing pretty well, but I'm not doing well enough to where I can pay someone else a decent livable wage yet. I just right. I can't do it. It's, it's very expensive. You know, if someone wants to make 50 or $60,000 a year, that's not, you know, something that would be uh, shocking for someone to want that kind of money. But that's a mm -hmm. lot if you got to pay it out running a business. Right. So um, I tend to go after people that don't need a livable wage. Larry, who works for me, is retired. He made his living. And he, he and I... I asked him what he wanted to make and he told me, can you pay me this much? And I said, yeah, absolutely. He just wants to have something to do. He enjoys it. And, you know, hopefully I keep it that way. So right, I don't lose great. him. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's not easy to, I can barely pay myself a, a full livable wage, you know, let alone several other people. So I think that's definitely a tough thing. And I get asked that question a lot by a lot of people. Yeah. But, um, I'm not the first one to figure that out. If you look at Home Depot or Lowe's or any, right. like they, they go after older retired people for a reason. They're yeah. not paying them $30 an hour. No, <laughs> I can promise no. you that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this isn't your full-time uh, gig, by the way. Um, I think maybe a lot of people don't um, know that. No. 
The, the, this it's, is your... It, it, well, it's my second full-time gig. Um, <laughs> yeah. My, yeah. True story. My original, <laughs> full-time, my, my original full-time gig is now part-time. So, um, yeah. But when I first started this, I was working a full-time job as a manufacturing engineer for a uh, automotive company, working normal, you know, 40-hour weeks and uh, traveling to Europe and Germany, running off machines and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And then as this became more and more real, um, I was fortunate enough that I approached my management and said, look, I, I need to make a decision pretty soon because I can't work 100 hours a week anymore. And um, they, they let me, fortunately, go to part-time. So pretty unheard of, someone my age working part-time as an engineer, but uh, they allowed that. Right. So I now only work two days a week. <laughs> oh wow yeah that's great yeah uh so and i so do they follow you on on instagram and youtube and all that kind <laughs> um, of stuff a lot of the management probably not no but yeah. i mean a lot of my it's no secret everybody yeah. i got m2 lumber on the side of my truck and i drive it right. to work every day so it's it's the cat's out of the bag you know yeah, easy like to um no i've been i've been very some people are you know very cautious about it in you know, because they would think like, oh, man, well, you know, what if your employer finds out they might like if you're working for someone who doesn't want you to succeed in life in general, like, right. get out of there anyway. So, yeah, I was never really worried about it at all. Um, I, I don't let it interfere with my with my work life, which is why I told them I need to go to part time because it was starting to get to that point to where it was interfering with my work life. So I said, hey, I need to work less so I can focus on this. So, yeah, um, yeah, some of them, though they know what I do and I don't know how much they care, but yeah. Yeah. When I, so this is also not my full-time job. I, I work in oil and gas for my full-time job, but oh, you know, nice. people, people ask me all the time, you know, Oh, is this your full-time gig? And I'm like, no, this isn't, this isn't my full-time gig. And it's, it's funny cause uh, the job that I'm in a lot of times I go out to uh, external events uh, with my company. Mm -hmm. And when I'm like, Oh, let me get a card. Some of my coworkers are like, which card are you going to give them? Am I going to give them the Voltner <laughs> Woodworking card or am I going to give them my, my company card? <laughs> I've, I've, I've done that before. I've yeah. been on business trips and I've I've told not people that work for the company I work for, but other other things like that. I've been at dinner events. And what's funny yeah. is that when you do that, you know, you're there. You're supposed to be talking about business work and everyone's kind of got on this like fake face like yeah okay let's talk about this blah, blah. yeah and then one time i was at dinner with a company and i mentioned you know what i was doing with the salmon and lumberyard and literally every eyes lit up and like oh my gosh and that's right. all we talked about for the rest of the evening because yep. they were like they it's, were actually interested in that <laughs> it it really it, it comes into an advantage so my my job is i'm a commercial negotiator essentially and so it, it's nice to be able to have something other than work to, to break the ice. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah. a lot of my counterparts at, at other companies that I deal with, they all follow me on Instagram and they're like, you know, when we get together, they're like, Hey man, that, that project you were just doing, that's pretty awesome. You know, we'll spend probably like 45 yeah. minutes talking about that stuff. And then it was like, okay, yeah. let's get down to the nitty gritty. Let's, <laughs> we, we actually got to talk <laughs> about work, work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, no, that's, that's, that's beneficial for sure. Yeah. And, and you probably enjoy talking about it a little bit more. <laughs> that to the job yeah job. I, I am guilt i'm guilty of that yeah i yeah. have no problem talking about that yeah so is there is there plans in the future um and you don't have to give a timeline because uh, your employer may follow us on it on make a lounge <laughs> podcast you know <laughs> <laughs> no they 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 know that the light is at the end of the tunnel yeah and that i'm i'm probably you know planning to exit pretty soon um, yeah because it's at two days a week it's like I can't, I can barely get anything done there. And it's like, I'm not, not like they're paying me a ton of money because it's only two days a week. Right. So yeah. Yeah. So you started uh, YouTube looks like probably about a year ago, I guess. Not, not too long ago. <laughs> no, it? or no, actually that's a, that's a funny story. I yeah. started it a long time ago Okay. and I'm, I don't know how many idiots you've met before, but uh, I'm one who deleted a YouTube channel that they owned on accident. Oh no. That had. Yeah. Yeah, that had like, I think, 10,000 subscribers or something like that already. Oh. I deleted it. No kidding. Yeah. So, so yep. And you, there's it, no it was, way to recover I was that kind to, of thing? No, no. I was trying to, so I created one a long time ago when I was 
in school back in college just yeah. random stupid crap but for some i had one video that we made of a of a four-wheeled bicycle that we made that i don't want to say it went viral but it had a million views on it okay. which was pretty cool um but i was trying to migrate to my new youtube channel for m2 lumber and so i thought i followed all the steps correctly and it popped up with this kind of vague question is like are you sure you want to do this and blah 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 and you know remove original content and i was like yeah, I'm migrating from here to here. Okay. And just deleted it. <laughs> oh, no. My heart just sank. I was like, wow. Were you monetized? But no, no, not yet. Okay. But I mean, I was pretty damn close. Right. I was pretty close. I was pretty wow. close. But so it's you're, whatever, you're, man. You're feeling the ache. Over. Yeah, you're feeling the ache all, all over again, I guess, that trying to break yeah. the... Well, I, I never really tried before. It just kind of weirdly happened, you know? Yeah. So... But now I'm like, we're trying to put some effort into it and actually do something with it this time around. So yeah, you're doing a, you're yeah. doing a lot of great stuff over there, and and I think collaborations yeah. like you had John come over and and do that video. I watched that one. Um, yeah, that, that worked good. pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. anything with John and it's probably going to do fairly well. I, think. I was about to say that that was that was all John. I mean, yeah. he did all the hard work. I just had to stay in there and. Yeah, I think it. he needs to just Make name his channel free. like. Midas Midas Woodworking or something because it's like he's got the <laughs> YouTube Golden Touch, <laughs> the the Mister Beast of Woodworking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got that thing good, nailed man. down. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, I guess what's the um, what's the big focus on the YouTube channel? Is it uh, is there a are you going after customers? Are you going after knowledge? Good question. <laughs> that is a good question. I, I think one one of the things that I want to try to share with people is is the knowledge and the things that I have learned about about woodworking. Now, probably not even woodworking because there's so much of that out there already, and I yeah. feel like there's a lot of people that are way more talented and knowledgeable than I am. But definitely on the sawmill side, mm -hmm. um, kiln drying, and maybe for maybe one thing I thought I had an edge on is actually running a wood business mm -hmm. because there's a lot of this is not an offense to anyone, but there's a lot of content creators online that are great content creators, but they don't actually run a wood business. Right, right. <laughs> and um, I think that's something that uh, at least you don't see too much of. So I was going to try to figure out a way where I could share that with people. Um, and then just, you know, random small things that I think are interesting and no one else probably will. So. Oh, I don't, I, I don't know about that. Try. I mean, so I go to Houston Hardwood. They're, pro they're probably my number one supplier here. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I go to them almost exclusively uh, and they're trying mm -hmm. to get like their Instagram running and stuff like that. But, you know, they probably have like a thousand uh, followers, whatever, which I would think they would have a lot more because every time I go in there, it's packed. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they're also old school. And I, I find that mm -hmm. the, that um, whole genre is is kind of old school. Like, you know, you have mm -hmm. you have 92 year old Bob and. You know uh, that that type of people working <laughs> that type yeah. of stuff, yeah. And um, you know they're they're just not wanting to they they want it, but they don't want it hard enough. I think they don't they don't yeah. have the drive get, like you've got. It's it's very it's very well. It's that I think too, but it's also I think we're a little bit more spoiled because we just we kind of grew up with it. Yeah, it was developed around us still when we were young enough to where it's been a part of our it's been a part of our lives for such a long time that it's not that unnatural for me to just be like, all right, I'm just going to take some videos and do YouTube or Instagram, you know, post every day. That's not that big of a deal for my dad to do that. Who's 65 years old. He's just yeah. like, Ugh, this is, you know, it's, it's yeah. very different because it's just not been a part of, you know, the way things that are he's done things. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's it's beneficial, especially because. You know, there's always going to be something new, I think, that is whether it's new technology or new ways to communicate with people or something like that. And social media has done tremendous things for us like that. Like we get so much business through just basically free social media advertising. You know, right. every time I take a post or a picture or something like that, um, I put it on Instagram or Facebook. That doesn't cost me anything. And yeah. thousands of people see it and some of them respond. Yeah, uh, we built our business based off of that, so that's it's very beneficial for sure. Yeah. Uh, so what's your what's your average customer like? What does your average customer look like? Are they coming in to buy one or two sticks? Are they buying stuff for large projects? It's it's, it's a mix. I'd say it's somewhere in between is going to be the average customer. So um, 
what we see most often are people just trying to get into woodworking. Okay. That's what we see most often. Um, I don't want to call them newbies uh, yeah. because we do have some other people that are experienced. Um, but a, a couple of disadvantages that we have is that we are a small sawmill. Mm -hmm. So at, at best, you know, we might have at one point a couple hundred board feet of, of a species in stock. We might not have any. Mm-hmm. Uh, like right now, I can't keep any kind of five-quarter white oak in stock. I don't have any right now. I've got more milled up waiting to come out of the kiln, but right now I have none. Yeah. And so that's a disadvantage for us because if you are a professional and you're on a timeline and a schedule, you know, you're going to call me once and say, hey, do you have five-quarter white oak? No, I don't. You're not going to call back again. Oh, yeah. So uh, I know that's an issue for us that we, we, we are losing potential customers because of that. But uh, it's just growing pains. There's nothing I can do about it except try to expand and do more and have more available and stuff. But yeah. so that's probably the reason why we don't see as many, I would say, full-time professional woodworkers. That's the smallest percentage of our uh, category of our customers because they are going to go somewhere, A, they can buy in huge quantities and get a wholesale discount, mm -hmm. which is not us. And then they got to make sure that every time they call that they're going to have what they need. Right. And so I understand. I don't hold that against anybody. I would do the same thing um, in that kind of situation. So a lot of times it's someone who needs, you know, one or two slabs or maybe, you know, 50 to 100 board feet or something like that. And they're trying to build something. And um, and I think we do really well with that, though. I'm, I'm glad that's the kind of person that we get in, because one of the things that we're able to do that a lot of lumber yards can't is also offer suggestions and advice to people on their building on their projects right so we build furniture too so we know every way you have ever screwed something up yeah we've already done it <laughs> like like yeah. you name it i have done it i can promise you yeah. um and so like when someone comes in we're not nosy but they say i'm looking for you know walnut and we always okay well what are you making mm -hmm. just you know starting conversation oh, i'm gonna build a table okay cool what kind of legs are you gonna do what kind of stuff we we know what questions need to be asked to make sure the, the worst thing that could happen is someone could walk in to me, and this has happened once before, so this is, this is how I know this. Mm -hmm. Someone can walk in. They say, I need this much wood. They, they look like maybe they don't know what they're doing, but we don't say anything. They buy it. They buy, say, $400 or whatever it is worth of wood, go home, and then realize they're in there over their head. They have no idea what they're doing, <laughs> and they just made a huge mistake. Yeah. And I actually had an 18-year-old kid walk in once, buy a whole bunch of, um, I think it was hickory or something, and then just like literally his dad made him call me and say, I'm sorry, can I please bring this back and get my money back? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah, OK, man, just come on, bring it back. But I put that on me. It's like I could tell when he was he wasn't he was asking the kind of questions that may help me know yeah. this kid probably doesn't know what he's doing. Right. You know, when someone when you say it's four dollars a board foot and they go, what's a board foot? Yeah, it's like, OK. Um, <laughs> well, even you know, a seasoned woodworker still and struggles go, with board feet. <laughs> no, no, that's, <laughs> yeah. and that's fine. But yeah. you know, like there's certain type of questions like that where like, you know, like what kind of skill saw should I use to rip this edge down to glue oh. these boards up? I'm like, eh, okay. Well, you don't have a joiner. You're not. Okay. Well, Hmm. You know, or what kind of pocket screws do you recommend for this? And it's like, okay. So we, we've yeah. learned now to, to not in an undermining way or anything like that. We don't want people to feel uncomfortable, but just to make sure that, when people leave, if they do buy from us, they're like, they're happy and confident and they know what they're doing. And if you look at our Google reviews and, and our Facebook reviews, that's, that's what it makes me the happiest that we see over and over and over again. Yeah. You know, not just our wood is, looks pretty, which I have no control over or that it's dry. That's a machine, mm -hmm. but it's the, these guys really helped me. They gave me suggestions and tips and I feel really good about what I'm doing now. That's, that's the part where we can win versus, any other store. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely an advantage that you've got because a lot of uh, makers will buy from, from a place like I, like I go to, uh, which, you know, hardwood supplier and they're getting that material from guys like you or, you know, your competitors that you were talking about who have, you know, larger scale mm -hmm. or whatever. And they're, those folks are calling ahead and they've, they've got an inventory list that they've got to keep up with and all that. Um, but they're primarily just a distributor. They're not out there. Yeah milling down the warehouse oh, yeah and so, so they may not even know like okay this one's got a pit this might not be good you know you might want to steer away from that they're just like okay right. measuring the wood getting it out the door 
writing the the invoice yeah. or yeah. or even worse they're they're going to the big box store and they're buying mm-hmm. the uh the curved pine uh and trying to build a table out of it <laughs> with no joiner yeah exactly yeah yeah and i mean i attribute it to like it's not a near as expensive but i attribute it to always say like imagine going to buy a car and you ask the salesman you know how fast can this car go or how comfortable it is or blah, blah blah or is this a good car for family and they just go i don't know it has wheels i, mean, I guess yeah <laughs> I mean, it's like yeah. it's it's ridiculous and so like we're we're there to like yeah, we can tell you. What do you want to know about walnut? I'll tell you everything there is to know about it. Right. If it's good for this, if it's good for that, how you should cut it, why you shouldn't, everything. Like that's that's what we pride ourselves on. Yeah, yeah. You're not. They're, they don't. Not just telling you the sticker price and what color it is. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Walnut. Yeah. It's brown. Dark brown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's brown and expensive. Yeah. Well, Let me know how much you want. Well, most of the walnut that I see is sapwood, so uh, <laughs> it's, oh, it's hard God, to yeah. hard to come by. Hard to come by. It is good, good material. It's, it's it's getting harder even even for us in this area. Yeah, yeah. It's getting more and more scarce. Are you uh, importing from other um, states or anything at this point, or is there plans to? <laughs> I hope not. Um, I don't want to do that because that would make things expensive. Mm-hmm. But um, we have talked about it <clears throat> as we get. As we get as we get bigger and bigger, and we have a more larger customer base, I'm getting more calls for requests for things that we don't have, mm-hmm. and you know, for a while you can just say, "Hey, no, sorry, that's that's not what we do." But after you get enough of those calls, you start scratching your head, going, well, "Why don't we do that?" Yeah, yeah. This is the <laughs> third call so, we've had um, for X, and yeah. yeah, or like the twentieth call. So, I mean, <laughs> one of the big things is is uh, South American imported woods. So we, we might try um, making a small import of some South American woods this year, maybe some, you know, guanacosta, monkey pod, stuff like that, and just kind of test the waters with that, see how that goes. Um, because, I mean, it's I've always prided myself on being, you know, hence the name, Save the Trees. Mm-hmm. We're a small sawmill. We mill local lumber, and that's what we have. Yeah. But fact is we've grown to be a lot more than that, you know, with everything that we're doing. And so – I want to keep the business growing so that we can do more. So we'll, we may consider importing other woods that aren't native to our area and stuff like that so that we can offer that to people. Yeah. What's the number one seller uh, that you see? Black walnut. Black walnut. Yeah. It's a yep. yeah. 40%, 40% for dollar. Everything that we sold last year was black walnut. Really? Wow. And we have 12, at least 12 different species of wood. 40% was black walnut. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, every time you ask somebody, you know, what's your favorite type of wood? Walnut is always the mm-hmm. the answer. <laughs> yeah. And it's because it has no competition as far as color. It's the only naturally dark brown wood that we have. Yeah. So Yeah. Don't don't paint it. People, this is a public service <laughs> announcement. Don't paint. <laughs> oh Lord. Yeah. 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 Um all right, so in the podcast, I don't know if you you listened to any of the other episodes that we uh, do games on this podcast. So I think this is a great mm-hmm. time to to play one of those games. One of the, the games that I like to play is called Rapid Fire. And so All in right. in this game, we uh, I get to use a fun little bell, and uh, I'll ask you a question, and you say the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay, okay. got it. Uh, let's see. I got to find it because I have a... a long list of rapid fire questions for future guests. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. Best thing about living in the country. Ooh, freedom. Freedom. Well, but like, does it the, have to be a one word answer? No, or? no, 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 no. You can elaborate. Oh, okay. No, no, but like living freedom in to do whatever in the countryside, freedom to do whatever should, the hell I want to do. I should have said countryside. Like you live yeah, freedom, do whatever the yeah, hell I want to do. Yeah. I can go pee off my front porch. Can you do that? <laughs> Definitely not. Not without getting a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. M- my neighbor is is ninety one years old, and uh, I'm pretty sure oh, he okay. would he would fall over if he saw me doing that <laughs> off my front porch. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that would be enjoyable to to be able to do that. And, I mean, freedom to start a sawmill business in your backyard. Right. I mean, I couldn't do that. No. Anywhere else. No HOAs and. 
you know, people no. telling you what type, yeah. what, what color your door can be or how many shrubs you have to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Matter of fact, there's some city municipality areas. If you tried to do what I was doing, even if you had the acreage for it, they would shut you down because you're not allowed to have a business in your backyard. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to have to Luckily, bookmark this, not one of those. bookmark this and share this with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I told her, I said, someday, babe, I'm going to have a 50 by 100 uh, uh, shop, you know, somewhere. Check. You better you better check with your, uh, well, you can have it for private use. No, I, I you just can't advertise it as a public business. I would have to tear down my house to build it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that too. <laughs> yeah, I want to move out to the country at some point. All right, next oh. question. Okay. Project that's taken you the longest to complete. Mm. Um, I know this is supposed to be rapid fire. I'm trying to think which one has actually been the longest. Does it have to be woodworking? No, no uh -uh. it doesn't, yeah. right? Nope. Okay. This is a chance uh, for people to get to know more about you in a, <laughs> in a short a, period of time. <laughs> we're doing a bathroom. Uh, it's not even a remodel. We added a bathroom to our house because we live in a very old house. It's built in 1847. It's 170 something years old. So we, it only had, it had zero bathrooms when they built it. Yeah. Then they were generous enough to put one in there. Well, I have two daughters and a wife, so one bathroom wasn't cutting it. Right. So we definitely. A second bathroom. <laughs> um, that second bathroom project started two years ago, <laughs> a year and a half ago. Yeah. And it's, and, and over Christmas break, I put all the molding and the trim down. Okay. So all that's left is caulk and paint. So I'm almost there. You know what they say? The cobbler's kids have no shoes, right? It's like all yeah, exactly. All of my woodworking projects go out the door to my customers. And my wife's like, hey, what about this thing? I Yeah. So now she just goes yeah. to home goods and, and buys what, you know, signs or whatever she wants in the house. So, so, so my wife threatens me with that. Yeah. And she knows that when she gets to a point where she's finally going to buy something, then I'll usually cave and be like, all right, fine. I'll just make it. <laughs> yeah. So, fine. I'll yeah. work 120 hours this week. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, this one may sting some somebody. We'll see. Uh oh. Okay. Sticker swaps. <laughs> um, I do them, uh, but I do it in a in a unique way to where I only take stickers from people that I have met in person. Nice. Yeah. So I have a wall with stickers on them, but there's only like fifteen of them up there, and I've met every single one of those people in person, like face to face, at yeah. least had a conversation and said, Hey, how you doing? Right. Nice to meet you. My name's Matt, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, I don't send them through the mail. Some people give them to me, uh, you know, send them through the mail and stuff like that. And I, not to be mean, I usually message them like, Hey, no offense, but yeah, this is me. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. So I have an auto. I think it's, I think it's, I know, I know some people hate them. Yeah. Um, John, I have no problem calling him out. John thinks it's the stupidest thing in the world. Yeah. The sticker swap thing. Um, but uh, again, I, I can understand his perspective on it. And that's why I took it and I made it something a little special for me to where it's, you know, it's just certain people. Yeah. So. I've got an auto response that tells people that, you know, I send out stickers with orders. So um, yeah. I used, oh, okay. there you go. I used that, to do um, that's one way to do it. Yeah. I used to do them. Um, now, Patrons mm -hmm. get stickers because we know in the maker community, uh, you're not a maker unless you have stickers. But uh, and that's one of my Absolutely, one yeah. of my couches. But um, so you know, I, if somebody becomes a patron, or if you know, if I interact with them on a regular basis, or uh, something like mm -hmm. that, or we you know we chat regularly, um, even yeah. via Instagram, I'll definitely do that. Like I will send them out a sticker. That's not yeah. not a problem. Uh, what I cannot yeah. stand is the people who have have just followed you and are like, Hey, you want to do a sticker swap? And, uh, yeah, no, so yeah. that, that has, I don't get those as much now as I used to. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's dying in the, in the community overall, it's not becoming as popular as it used to be, but, um, yeah, but yeah, I keep a whole stack of them on our checkout counter in the shops. So when people come in to buy whatever it is or whatever, there's a whole stack of them right there and they say, Hey, can I have a sticker? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Knock yourself out. That's why they're So there. for anybody on the live stream or for the, uh, for anybody watching on YouTube or uh, Spotify, uh, we we do the video version on Spotify uh, so people can see this this okay. mustache of yours. We'll get to that after this game. Ah. Um, mm. 
Better get it combed. We're going to be talking about it. Uh, but yeah, mm. so I've got a couple stacks sitting here at my desk that I can send out. There you go. That's impressive. Um, <laughs> I can also do a little bit of a flare with mine. I was about to say, you got a pretty, yeah. pretty, yours is just hiding behind the that beard. beard. Yeah. If you would shave that yeah. beard off, you'd have a killer mustache too. And I'm just now <laughs> noticing that there's a lot of gray in it tonight and I need to hit the just for men again. <laughs> But that, hey, you know what? That's why I don't have a beard because it's very gray. Oh yeah, very gray. Yeah, my wife won't let I me shave it off. So, uh, I, I, <clears throat> my compromise was: can I use just for men? Because <laughs> it's not fair to be That's bald good, yeah. and have gray hair. I, I got both, <laughs> both bad genes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so stickers. I mean, it, it, it's kind of it is a part of the community. Um, I, I enjoy mm -hmm. seeing all the different types of stickers, but. Uh, for me, if if you're just if you just now followed me, and you're doing it as a you know follow for follow thing, that's going to be an instant no. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Uh, next question: mm -hmm. Podcasts or music? Both. Is that an acceptable that's ac answer? That's acceptable. Yeah. Mix it up a little bit. Yeah. I, I and I do and I do a lot of audiobooks. Oh, me too. Um, not not as. Not as much now because I don't have a commute to work anymore. <laughs> but Very when short I used books. to drive to yeah. work every day, <laughs> yeah, when I used to drive to work every day, I would do audio books because um, I like I, I'm I'm a I'm a glutton for knowledge. I love to consume you know uh, that kind of information, and usually the really good stuff is is in a book. Um, and um, I I enjoy reading, but I rarely have time to do it because of the choices that I make to fill up my day. So. Audiobooks work out really well for me. Yeah. And I, I enjoy the occasional podcast stuff too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Cool. Good answer. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I did an entire class on uh, botany and uh, basically intro to forestry uh, with an audiobook. Let me see. Is my button going to work? There it is. There it is. Uh, okay. Tool you've owned the longest. Tool that I have owned the longest. That would probably be just like your old cheap. Uh, what is it? Is it a porter cable? I think I have a porter cable circular saw. Okay. And I bet you. I remember when I bought it from Lowe's. That was like my first. Because again, like I mentioned, my dad had a tool shop. When I first started doing stuff, I would still go back to my parents' house and I would use his workshop. Yeah. And, and, you know, build stuff. He had a grizzly table saw and I would always use his stuff to build things. And then I finally had to get stuff on my own and we had our own house. So I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to get my own tool collection. And yeah. <laughs> bought a $69 porter cable, yeah. but that thing's a beast. You can't kill it. Right. I mean, it's actually got more power. This is going to get me in trouble. Probably. It's got more power than my <laughs> festival. Oh yeah. It really does. Yeah. It doesn't cut probably as clean or nice, but power wise, you cannot stop that thing, man. Really? I mean, it'll, it'll, Oh yeah, it'll trip or break her before that saw dies. Nice. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's a beast. Well, cool. Yeah, that's that's a game we like to call uh, rapid fire. Uh, you did you did good. Right. You passed. Uh, so yes. so we'll give you a, a gold star on that. <laughs> maybe I can get a sticker. Yeah, maybe once I meet you in person. <laughs> <laughs> for the second, for the second time. time, yeah. We so uh, for the listeners, yeah. we we met at Workbench Con and we uh, last year. Uh, I think we talked for approximately a minute and a half and uh, kind of just passing from event to event. That, Forgot about it. Yeah. yeah. Th those things are, it's yeah. a whirlwind that workbench con. It is. It is. But yeah. are you going, I'm assuming you're going this, this year. <sighs> I don't know. On the fence. I don't know. I really, really want to this year. Yeah. It's really, it's more just about if I can, if I can afford the time yeah. to be down there, that's, that's my biggest thing. So I'm still up in the air about it. Yeah, I really want to go. You're you're stretched sure stretched yet. pretty thin between uh, yeah. all the and to be off for three days, you know, four probably it, it, that would be tough. So yeah, we will see. Yeah, <laughs> well, hopefully you can make it there, and um, I'll extend a special invite to the podcast recording with Surf Prep if you're going to be there. So oh yeah yeah. So Surf Prep, you just joined the Surf Prep family. So congratulations. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Hannah sent me a nice little care package. Yeah. 
it th- those those really things cool. are 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 nice i mean i think people don't realize mm-hmm. until they get a quality tool like that in their hands mm-hmm. i mean i i went through probably five different uh sanders you know bosch i bosch was kind of yeah. like my go-to prior to surf prep um mm-hmm. you know i think they're 69 79 bucks something like that um and you know i would i would just buy the the red sandpaper off of you know from the big box store and <laughs> you know and, and like mm-hmm. sand for a minute or two and then throw it and then get the next one and throw it and stuff like that mm-hmm. um and yep. i didn't realize how much time and and money i was investing in in something yeah. for a sub yeah. a subpar type of sanding job um yeah so i think you know talking about tools uh you know that you know just like your kiln it you know you got to do that that investment and and invest in a in good tools uh so so we so we did interesting fact we did 350 hours of sanding last year no way no way Mm -hmm. wow so so when we when we when we have someone come in and they buy something from us the way i ring up an invoice and charge for it is i charge by the hour for the services that we do and every single step of the process has its own own hourly rate and its own ticket. Wow. So if I'm going to sand a table flop for two hours, it's literally two hours of sanding. And so I can run a report at the end of that. And so, yeah, we did 300 and 350-ish hours of sanding last year. So we do a lot of sanding. Wow. Lot, lots of time for podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Well, I, I'm pretty good about making sure my employees do the same yeah. thing, not me, because I hate Oh, so it. you're, a, you're a smart business owner. <laughs> Yes, I try yeah. to be. I try yeah. to be as much as I can. Yeah, it's like uh, this is the teenager rite of passage into woodworking. Yeah. What about the kids? Pretty much. You, yeah. You get the kids. Absolutely. The kids in there uh, in the shop. They could care less. Oh, they really? could care less. Yeah. No. I think. I think. I think they're they're too too exposed to it. It's not a big deal to them at all because it's so much a part of my life and you know all of our lives. So they don't. Yeah. They don't really want to do anything out there. Yet we'll see. I got a 13 year old and an eight year old, so maybe yeah. you know as they get older they might. But yeah, who knows. yeah. I don't pressure it on them. But when they if do they it, they're going to cool, want. They don't want to do it. That's fine. When they do it, they want something. <laughs> like oh yeah, for yeah. sure. If I oh no 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 my oldest she she's not into the into the woodworking side of it and stuff like that. But uh, I've trained her well on being a, a very smart businesswoman. Oh, yeah. She makes pretty good money <laughs> by just doing chores around that. It, we have, I have an app on my phone. It's called Choresy. And I put in all the stuff that I want them to do. And they don't have to do it. Yeah. But if they want money, they can go do it. And then they check it off. And it shows them how much they've earned. Oh. Man, she can wipe me out. <laughs> I mean, she makes like $100 a month. Just doing, short, but she does the work, so I can't complain. Right, you right. Know? It's getting done. I'm gonna have to yeah, take that one yeah. down as a note because I've got a, an 11, uh, almost 12 year old, and a and, and an eight year old. So yeah, uh, there. She started wanting to buy a lot of things, and I started to tell her you can make your own money, right? And and buy it yourself. And now, ironically, she makes the money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she won't spend a she won't spend a penny. Oh, of really? It. Uh, yeah, she's so. become a saver because she knows the value of it. She knows the value of it because of all the work that she's done. So when she wants to go get something, I'm like, "You got money? Yeah. Eh, no, nah, I don't need it." Yeah, <laughs> she'll put it back. So yeah, it's good. Great, it's great good. life lesson because then you're they, mm-hmm. they realize, hey, dad is out there doing all this stuff in the shop, um, and exactly. he is making money. Uh, so that way we can mm-hmm. buy Cheetos. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, try to tie yeah. it together. Uh, well, Matt, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Um, we are going to do uh, the, yeah, the after show. Oh, wait, actually, I have to ask you about the mustache. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. So, um, actually, Annette uh, with Five Thirteen Woodworks, she's one of our patrons, oh, yeah. and uh, she's yeah. awesome. I love Annette. Um, mm-hmm. She she asked. Um, I was going to save this for the after show, but we'll just go ahead and knock it out here because I mentioned in the intro. Um, she says, what's the deal with the mustache? First of all, what's the deal with the <laughs> I don't think that's exactly how she phrased it. Uh, but it's, it's definitely an impressive mustache. Those of you who are listening to this in the audio medium, uh, if you don't follow Matt, you definitely should do that. M2 lumber on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, 
but so she asked, what's the deal with the mustache? Let's, let's knock that one out. And then she's got another question. We'll, we'll talk about in the after show. Well, um, the mustache is only a couple of years old. Uh, had a beard and mustache and facial hair for a while, but, uh, I probably, I'm not going to get too deep into it psychologically, but you know, growing up, my dad always had a mustache. Yeah. Always like ever since I can remember. And so for me, it's probably just like, cool, I'm going to do this too. And (laughs) I did a little bit more extreme than he ever did. (laughs) Um, And the same way now that I'm used to it, my wife is my kids. If I shaved this thing off, they would, they would kick me out of the house. I'm pretty sure you'd lose followers. (laughs) Yeah, I probably would too. It's, it's, and I mean, it does kind of, it's sort of stereotypical with the industry, yeah. with the sawmill lumberyard type thing. You know, I'm, I don't wear flannel, but I mean, that's flannel and suspenders and the mustache and boom, there yeah. you go. I'm, I'm cliche as it gets. I had uh, Suman and Scott Walsh on uh, for a holiday episode. Oh, God. And that was a, a hoot uh, having them on. Yeah. And Scott was like, yeah, I'm think- mm-hmm. I've been thinking about uh, shaving my, my beard off. And I was like, oh, so you're giving up woodworking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. exactly yeah it's pretty you kind of need need that uh, yeah. but so tell uh you know people can follow you on instagram youtube um mm-hmm. uh, at m2 lumber um do you do tiktok mm-hmm. uh not really okay. no we do have a tiktok page yeah. but i don't really put much stuff out there on it yeah I'm taking I I'm just, taking a survey basically uh, on all my guests on who does TikTok and that is the consistent answer is that yeah I'm on it Izzy Izzy, Izzy does it and he kills yeah. it I mean there's a lot of people um, the southern uh, southern lumber you know a company I mean he does it and um, they kill it too I don't the one thing that I I've started to think about is if I'm going to invest time and effort into it how is it going to repay me. So I'll tell you the reason I don't do TikTok, and maybe this is a mistake and I'm wrong, but I know the demographics of the people that are on Instagram. I know my demographics of those that are on Facebook, yeah. and I know my demographics of those that are on YouTube. The demographics of the people that are on TikTok probably aren't coming in to buy wood from me anytime soon. Right. Yeah. I, I, or probably aren't buying furniture from me anytime soon. Right. So what's the point in me putting a video out on yeah. TikTok? So that's why I don't do it. Yeah, your return on investment yeah. on TikTok is is fairly low for, it's, for what you do, I think. Yeah, it's it's everything that we do online, you know, uh, not to try to make it sound like I don't care or anything like that, but it's all it's all got a business mindset in it mm-hmm. in the end, you know. Every post that we do on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, it's it's for business. Yeah. That's why we do that. I think that's smart and that's that's the right way to approach uh, when you set up a a business page for Instagram or yeah. YouTube, um, yeah. now there are people who right. who follow just to follow. Um, I've got a personal account for that, um, and I yeah. I don't follow a lot of woodworkers on that personal account because if I'm if I'm feeling like I just want to you know catch up with friends, I don't want to be inundated with the mm-hmm. stuff that I see already. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, thanks for, for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. And, uh, we'll, we'll do the after show. Yeah, um, so make sure okay. you give, give Matt a, a follow and I'll put all of the links in the description, uh, where you are listening to this podcast or watching. If you're watching on Spotify or YouTube, uh, links will be in the description there. I'm Matt with Fulton Woodworking and you can find me on Instagram and YouTube primarily. And I tell people don't follow me on TikTok because it's just reposts of my Instagram content. <laughs> <laughs> make sure you're following the maker lounge podcast as well um on all those mediums and uh, i don't think i've actually posted any uh, tiktok because again the demographics over there uh is not for podcasts but follow the maker lounge podcast uh on instagram and youtube make sure you leave a review wherever you're listening to this it helps uh, get the podcast out to other people to listen uh so they can hear matt's story and and the other guests that we have on And I want to say special thanks to Surf Prep again. Um, If you are interested or in the market and you don't want to spend uh, 300 and, what would you say, 20 hours uh, with a... 350 Yeah, with a uh, a crappy sander, (laughs) make that investment. Uh, You can make that investment with a 10% uh, discount by using the code MAKERLOUNGE, all one word, at surfprepsanding.com. And also... Thanks again to the patrons. We've got a couple patrons that have uh, joined us in the YouTube tonight. 
Um, so make sure that uh, you get in on that action by going to patreon.com slash maker lounge podcast. There's a number of tiers there as low as $3 a month. Uh, so less than your, your five bucks coffee and uh, you can get extra, you know, perks. Uh, I've only got a number of top tier patrons left in, in that top tier. Uh, so I limit that because I give them special shout outs like Jimmy McAnally, who's on the stream right now. So thanks, Jimmy. Uh, Matt uh, with Archiano Serio, Victor with Wim Design, Justin Calvary Customs, who also, is also on and been chatting, and uh, Brent with Clean Cut Woodworking, along with other uh, patron members. And so you can write in questions for the show. And we are going to head in o- to over to the after show. 